from Abuja. It's all about the human struggle to raise the level of living. That's what it's all about. I'm Magnus Packle, and this is Magnus Packle GBA. I appreciate your being a part of our show. In view today, the violence of unsafe drinking water in Africa. To discuss this, we have Dr. Michael Ojo, the country representative in Nigeria for water aid. But before that, in our quick view, broadband internet in Africa. That's coming right up. Africa has the least broadband internet penetration in the world, with a penetration rate of 15.6% compared to the average global penetration rate of 34.3%. According to the World Internet Statistics, Nigeria has the largest number of broadband internet users in Africa, with an estimated 48.4 million users. Egypt has the second largest with an estimated 29.8 million users. Morocco is third, with an estimated 16.5 million users. Kenya has the fourth largest number of users, with an estimated 12 million, while South Africa has the fifth largest number of broadband internet users, with 8.5 million users. However, please note that these numbers include mobile phone broadband access. The numbers are spectacularly lower among African countries compared to advanced economies when considering just fixed broadband. According to McKinsey and Company, a 10% increase in broadband internet household penetration increases a country's GDP by about 0.1% to 1.4%. Also, Bose and Company, another global management consulting firm, has stated that a broadband internet penetration of 10% or higher in one year can increase labor productivity growth by 1.5% over the following five years. According to a Gallup survey, only about 20% of households worldwide have access to the internet at home. However, the number is said to be correlated with the advancement of a country's economy. Countries with a GDP per capita of more than $25,000 had broadband internet access of up to 80%. Countries with less than $2,000 in GDP per capita were found to typically have less than 5% broadband penetration among households. There is increasing popularity of broadband internet in Nigeria. However, Nigeria still needs some critical infrastructure to meet up with up-to-date internet technology demand. Although internet-enabled smartphones are helping to make up for deficiencies in broadband internet penetration in Africa, the high cost of these smartphones, as well as the high cost of the data plans, continue to limit appeal. Mass appeal, that is. The internet has completely changed the way global business is done. Therefore, in Africa, the evidence of urgent attention needs to be visible to give confidence that Africa is acquiring the information and communication technology needed to be competitive in global business. Still in view, what are challenges in Africa? But up next in our hidden economics, high heel shoes as economic indicators. Stay with us. A pair of high heel shoes has been a good friend of women for thousands of years. According to economists, the color of women's clothing and the height of women's shoe heels have an interesting relationship with the economic cycle. From hemlines to lipstick, female fashion trends have long been seen as indicators for the economic situation. Indeed, if you want a good economic indicator, just start looking at what women are wearing. The brighter the colors and the higher the heels, the worse the economy is. Modern high heel shoes reappeared in the 16th century, precisely in 1793, 
when Marie Antoinette, the wife of French King Louis XVI, went to the guillotine to be executed wearing a pair of brilliant high heel shoes. The advantage of the tall look, style, good body posture, good looking legs that the high heel shoe brings is essential when the economy is slow and you want to be chosen ahead of the bunch for the job. And even when not looking for a job, we want to keep you if you look so good. According to experts on the matter, the average height of heels mentioned in social media in the United States rebounded from 3 inches in the first half of 2008 to 6 inches in the second half as the U.S. financial bubble burst and the U.S. economy turned more negative. Indeed, according to reports, women's heels peaked in the first half of 2009 at 7 inches before retreating back to around 4 to 5 inches through 2010 and then settling at around 2 inches in the most recent IBM analysis as the global economy has improved. As Trevor Davis, a consumer product expert with IBM's Global Services Unit has said, in an economic downturn, heels go up and stay up as consumers turn to a more flamboyant fashion as a means of fantasy and escape. Cindy Lauper, the singer in her 1980s hit, probably thought young girls just want to have fun. Turns out that's not always the case, as they really want to be taken seriously with their heels, especially when the economy is weak. So, economists and policymakers, if you're looking for indicators, just look for girls and check out their heels. Our hidden economics for you. In Africa, the struggle for access to clean drinking water is indicative of how water scarcity leads to the stalling of human progress. It is an issue that touches all aspects of development, including health, education, agricultural productivity, peace, and opportunities for women and children. Related to this is the importance of sanitation for economic development. To discuss this important subject, we have with us Dr. Michael Ojo, country representative for Water Aid Nigeria. Dr. Ojo was previously head of transport and environment at London Councils. Please join me in my discussion with Dr. Michael Ojo. Dr. Ojo, um, recently there was a big uh, presidential summit uh, on water in, in Abuja. And uh, since then, uh, there's been continued attention you know, paid to water. What, what, what really is the water situation in, in Nigeria today? Um, the, well, the, there's a simple answer to the question, um, which is uh, water situation in Nigeria is um, improving slightly. Uh, but the sanitation situation is getting much worse. But behind all of that, um, uh, the, the Presidential Water Summit was in fact a landmark opportunity yeah. to bring together a, a range of key actors across uh, the country and internationally to begin to focus attention on the, one of the key issues that's um, getting in the way of um, providing access to water in the way that we should as a country. And there, for me, there are about five things that came out of the summit which are issues for the future. And uh, you won't be surprised that the very first thing is about funding. And you know, the, the summit itself was actually looking at how to bring in funding into the water sector. So the issue there is how do we get more money uh, to fund the sector, sure. uh, but also how do we target the money that's coming in into the right areas? And thirdly, how do we um, ensure that we're getting the most value for that money? Uh, the second issue um, which came out of that summit was actually looking at the national um, regulatory and the policy framework, which um, exists on paper but hasn't been signed off uh, for many years, which means People are working to something, but it's not an agreed plan. And so the need for us as a country to actually resolve this issue yeah. and have a national legislative framework around water and sanitation and hygiene that people can work to and actually um, invest in 
Um, again, the issue of um, the, the water sector generally and the lack of coordination within the sector. You know, so uh, we as international um, partners are doing some work. Central government is investing heavily. Um, other people are investing in different ways. But yeah. coordinating all of that together to, into a proper um, cohesive plan yeah. um, is one of the areas that's lacking. And beyond that, also looking at how WASH that's water sanitation hygiene okay. um, uh, relates to other areas like health yeah. and education yeah, and you know the wider environment yeah. because um, if we if we're able to address the lack of access to water and sanitation and hygiene then we begin to address the the drivers of some of the some costs of the issues, yeah. that go into health service provision and also um, open the opportunities for more children to be able to attend school is I, coming I, I from this term, uh, structural violence against mm. the people from, from um, a, a Dr. Jeff Dumas of the University of Texas at Dallas. Now, he, he talks about the fact that, you know, we have accidents on our roads and there's violence against the people. But he said that there's even greater violence inflicted against the people from lack of access to safe drinking water and from sanitation. Exactly. Because he, he looks at the number of people that die from road accidents and he says, is you have an equivalent number of people also dying, especially as you said, you know, from simple things like diarrhea. Yep. Uh, Chelsea Clinton was here, I think was last year, you know, talking about safe drinking water and all of that, and she said it was regrettable, that it was unconscionable, that in this day and time, we were losing so many people, we were just having so many people still die yep. from diarrhea. Are we the worst in Nigeria compared to other African countries? I, I think, um, I w before answering that question directly, um, I really just wanted to, just to underline you know, the, 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 the introduction that you gave there. Um, like I said, we call it an avoidable crisis. It's a crisis that really can be avoided with the right political will and the means put behind that, so the right investment. And Nigeria is a big country. Nigeria has a population variously uh, put at between 160 million and 180 million. Um, so anything that um, is wrong in Nigeria creates a problem for sub-Saharan Africa. Yes. So when I talk about the impact of uh, lack of access to sanitation and, and clean water in Nigeria and the economic impact and the social and health impact, it represents half of the problem in West Africa and a quarter of the problem in sub-Saharan Africa. Yes. So for us as a, as a region to... Um, uh, you know, to meet our Millennium Development Goals around water and sanitation. Nigeria has to meet its, its goals on water and sanitation, otherwise it doesn't work. So Nigeria per capita is the worst uh, in, in, in Africa. And this is a problem that we really need our leaders to, yeah. to wake up to. Um, because, you know, children especially are needlessly dying. Uh, our women are, are you know, having productive years and days taking off them yeah. um, for a reason that is totally avoidable. Absolutely. Totally you know, avoidable. On that, you know, as you just said, you know, I, I, I was privileged to, to serve in the government you know, a few years back. And then I would hear that we had 60% access to safe drinking water. This was back in the early 2000s. And today we're still at about 60% access to safe drinking water. But my problem is when I hear the 60%, what are they counting? Oh. Are they counting the people that have their own boreholes, people that are providing their own water, or are they counting water that is coming from water board? But what's that, where's that 60% from? That's a really good question. Um, the, the 60, uh, yeah, going back a few years, um, figures might have been bandied around. And um, I guess that would be, you know, what people estimated at the time. Now, the basis for the estimation, I am not sure. But we have current estimates, which um, attempts to include all of as comprehensive as, as we can make it, uh, the data that's available to us. And so for now, uh, Nigeria um, has moved from 58% uh, access in terms of water to about 61% yeah. as in terms of the 2013 current figures that we have. Yeah. But like you rightly said, uh, that represents um, all access, including what government provides and what we as um, individuals provide we, for we ourselves. So this 60-61% that we're talking about, that's actually made up of about 10% of uh, government provision in our urban centers 
and even worse in the rural uh, uh, areas where it's less than 1%. So the majority of the access that people have is where people have provided water for themselves. And this begins to speak to an increasing problem that we're seeing in our, in our urban centers. Are they testing the, 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 water is, the water is normally, it's, we call them improved uh, sources okay. of water. So they're, 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 they're safe. Okay. They're safe for people to use. Um, most people provide for themselves and yeah. they will make sure that the water is safe. But I always think that, I think that in Nigeria, we, we lay so much at the footsteps of the federal government, yeah. at the doorstep, I meant to say, at the doorstep of the federal government. Like, the, you know, it, it seems to me, it only seems to me, and uh, you are the expert in this area, that for something like this, we should have community responsibility, uh, provincial or local government responsibility, state responsibility, and then federal government responsibility. But it seems to me that what happens is federal seems to take over everything. Is that the way, is that the best way to have it done? Is that how it's done, say, in the UK? Um, in, in, in the, way, the way it should be, uh, because ac provision of water, um, infrastructure and access is a, is, a, is a government responsibility. And how government um, manages that is then it, it's, it's, it's a different issue. But government should recognize its responsibility to provide access to water and sanitation for its citizens. Yeah. And people should demand that. I mean, that really is a right that they should yeah. demand. It's not free but the provision should be made. So government has to devise a way of bringing uh, funding in from the private sector, yes. of coordinating the funding that's coming in from people like ourselves Absolutely. and bigger players you know, like uh, the institutional funders um, who, who are doing a lot of work in Nigeria and find a way of um, managing that investment yes. uh, and ensuring that the sector is properly coordinated. Uh, but that relies on government also setting out what its plans are. So a lot of promises have been made. We're asking and we want government to really keep the promises that they've made. Yeah. Stop making any more. Uh, you know, just, you know, keep the promises you've made in terms of funding, in terms of coordinating the sector, in terms of putting the right framework in place, in terms of ensuring that um, the other people who are bringing money in are properly coordinated on the amount of investment that government is able to bring in and how it is able to encourage private, private sector, sector investment come to come how, in. How will it so really it is possible, here. very how, difficult. How can the private sector come in? Why is the private sector not in the picture right now? Uh, because the environment is not conducive for that. Um, uh, because there is no regulatory environment that provides them a, a clear um, set of um, guidance or rules about what government wants to do. There is no plan that shows them where the government wants to be in about 20, 30 years' time. Yes. And when you want to put in private sector funds into uh, an endeavor, you really want to be sure uh, that the policy environment is, is stable and the investment is I I potentially unsafe. Now, to, to wind up here, what, what would be your final thoughts on, on water and sanitation that, that yeah. you would want our viewers uh, to, to take away with them? I think the key thing, the, the key message is um, the way that w where we are as a nation in Nigeria is a tragedy and people can actually bring money in to help government to fulfill the requirements um, of, of providing the access to water and sanitation. Government needs to keep its own promises in terms of the funding that goes into the sector, in terms of making sure that the sector is properly coordinated and we have a, a regulatory framework that people can buy into and, can, and, 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 um, and work with. And also uh, really focusing on sanitation because for us that is a major crisis. Uh, it's killing our children, it's stopping our mothers from being able to um, you know, do productive work with their time, it's holding young girls away from school where there's no facilities in the school um, and so on and it's costing us as an economy and every dollar Every naira that we invest as a country will pay itself back um, seven, eight times uh, to the economy. And so investing in sanitation, investing in safe access to water makes economic sense. And this is the message I really want to get across to, to government and also to our people to ensure that um, they put pressure on those who have um, the, um, those who have the, uh, the, 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 the responsibilities over them yeah. uh, to ensure that they provide the services to them because it's a right that every Nigerian should have access to. Wonderful. On that note, Dr. Joe, I want to thank you. So thank, you much. thank you very much, Magnus. Thank you. I appreciate it.
worldwide around 1.1 billion people lack access to improved water sources and 2.4 billion have no basic sanitation the world health organization unicef joint monitoring program noted that sub-saharan africa makes up over 40 percent of the 1.1 billion people who live without access to clean drinking water According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States, each year about 3 million children below the age of 5 worldwide die from diarrhea illnesses, mostly infected by contaminated water. In Africa, diarrhea is responsible for as much as 7.7% of all deaths compared to 4.0% worldwide. Although there are large disparities among countries and between their urban and rural areas, Sub-Saharan Africa in general appears unlikely to meet the Millennium Development Goal of halving the share of the population without access to safe drinking water and sanitation by the year 2015. Currently, only Burkina Faso, Gambia, Ghana, Malawi and Namibia have met this target. Nigeria is ranked as the 114th country in terms of access to portable water and sanitation. So we can see that unless Nigeria is able to combat its water and sanitation needs, it could be impossible to achieve success in other pressing areas such as economic empowerment, good health and food security by 2015. It is well known that the average Nigerian depends on water from boreholes and wells for their drinking. Even the richest households in the biggest cities rely on independent provision of their own drinking water. And it is not clear how safe some of the boreholes actually are. As often, there are no real tests done to ensure that the water is free of heavy metal or other contamination. Nearly half of the world's population depends on groundwater, often known as the invisible resource, for drinking water supply and for other uses. We have to try not to degrade our groundwater by polluting our aquifers. We must recognize the importance of groundwater resources and the implications of not managing it well. We need water not only to drink and to wash our bodies and property, but also to cleanse the earth and keep it enriched for the future. Water is life. I'm Magnus Paco, and that's my people.